Hello everyone, welcome to the next installment in my quest to conquer Eve. In the last chapter, I went single stage from the surface of Eve to Kerbin, and a lot of people asked what the next step was. Some people suggested that I try to go single stage from Kerbin all the way to Eve and back without ISRU, but that's essentially double the range of what I just put a lot of effort and just barely managed to do, so that's pretty unthinkable. But one thing I thought might be doable is going single stage from sea level on EVE to orbit. So in this video, that's what I'm going to try to do. Short of grossly exploiting the aerodynamic model, it's not going to be possible to use chemical rockets to go all the way from sea level to orbit. For one, the thick atmosphere is going to mean we're going to lose a lot of velocity to drag, and the rockets aren't going to be operating as efficiently as low altitude because of the pressure. So I'm going to need to get the air pressure on EVE to work in my favor. To do this, I'm going to use propeller engines. This is going to be a fully stocked mission, so I'm going to use large reaction wheels for the torque, and then use RTGs to provide the electrical power needed to run these. The core objective of this craft is for it to be able to go from EVE orbit, land on EVE unassisted, and then take off from sea level and make it all the way back to orbit. For this reason, I'm going to take the simple approach and just give it a refueling run when it reaches low EVE orbit and then refuel it again when it returns to low EVE orbit. Before I launch the refueling mission, I do want to take note of something. I mentioned earlier that it wouldn't be possible with conventional rockets to go all the way from sea level on EVE to orbit without gross exploitation of the aerodynamic model. Now, using propellers helps some, but there is one exploit of the aero model that I do want to point out before someone else does, and that is all the rocket engines in the plane have been clipped together in the fairing at the rear. This is a level of glitching out the arrow model in the game that I that I usually try to avoid. I do want to point out that nothing else in this design is clipped. All the other fuel tanks are placed normally, and same thing for all the wings and the nose cones. With that said, let's get my refueling rocket into orbit. This is going to be a very simple, straightforward two-stage rocket with 65 mammoths on the lower stage and 60 wool pounds on the upper stage. From here, it's going to be a very straightforward standard ascent to orbit, and then a transfer from low Kerbin orbit to low EVE orbit of both the plane and the refueler. So I'm going to take the time and talk about something that's really important in making the kind of videos that I make in Kerbal Space Program. As a sandbox game, there is no wrong way to play Kerbal Space Program. Adding parts, editing existing parts, editing the game physics, all of these are totally legitimate things to do. However, if you're, you're publishing missions you've done, especially if you're responding to a challenge that others are working on, it's really important that you accurately represent the mission that you've done. All of the KSP videos on my channel so far have been stock missions and have been billed as such. As a result, if I were to have added parts or edited parts or edited the game physics, this would have been cheating and at the very least would have been a betrayal of trust to the people who watch this channel. Doing this would also cheat other people who are working on these challenges. I always pay attention to the other really impressive things that people are doing in Kerbal Space Program. Not just because it's fun and really entertaining to watch, but also because I learn a lot of things from these. I learn techniques that I can use in my own challenges or get an idea for a challenge I can do. Doing something awesome in KSP helps the whole community push forward the boundary of what's possible. Cheating and misrepresenting a mission in KSP hurts the community because it sets a false standard of what's possible and detracts from the awesome stuff that people are doing. Going back to the beginning, it's all about accurate representation. Some people like to add challenge and missions by not using quick saves. I like to push the limit of what's theoretically possible, so I always use quick saves, and in missions like this, I quick save a ton. If I were to claim that I didn't, that would be cheating. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned that I had clipped together engines at the rear of the plane, but that I hadn't clipped together any of the other fuel tanks and hadn't reversed the nose cones or used other aerodynamic exploits. If this wasn't true, again, this would be cheating. So in conclusion, accurately representing KSP missions is really important to the community as a whole. If you see something in a mission that looks impossible, ask about it. However, please ask about it and don't just call people out. There can always be tricks and new things in the game that you're unaware of. I'm constantly discovering new things in this that I didn't know about. 
With that tangent complete, both the plane and the refueler have reached low EVE orbit, and it's time to rendezvous, dock, and refuel. The docking here proved to be quite a bit more difficult than normal, partly because the grabber arm is fairly picky when it comes to the angle, and partly because the amount of part count here was really putting a burden on my computer. You might notice that the textures and a lot of the other graphics settings are turned down, and that was preferable to my computer crashing and not being able to run it at all. With the plane fully refueled, it's time to land. Actually being able to land on EVE with full fuel tanks is quite unusual, and I haven't been able to do that with any of my previous EVE SSTOs. The reason is you can't just dive a plane straight into the atmosphere of EVE. There'll be too much heating and it'll burn up. And normally when you're full on fuel, you don't have enough lift from the wings to be able to slow your descent long enough to be able to slow down enough so this doesn't happen. However, you might have noticed that this craft has an absolutely absurd amount of wing area that'll come into play during our ascent, but it also helps with the descent by allowing myself to control my descent and go down as slow as I want. Now, it would in theory be possible to aerobrake anywhere on EVE and then fly to where I want to go, but that would both take a really long time and risk the strike of the Kraken, which is always a problem with stock props and a huge part count. I'm going to land on the western shore of the Crater Lake. This is advantageous for a couple of reasons that will come into play during the ascent, and it's also close enough to sea level that I feel comfortable claiming it as such. The high amount of wing surface on this plane, coupled with the thick atmosphere on EVE, means that almost anything other than stationary is above stall speed, which is good because anything other than stationary is going to take a long time for our wheel brakes to slow down. After a mighty and long struggle, the wheel brakes did finally succeed in bringing my craft to a stop, turning it around so I was facing perpendicular to the gradient of the slope also helped. Thankfully, this plane does come equipped with a kneeling system that I stole from the City of Toronto bus transportation system, so Bill will be able to get out and plant a flag for posterity. Since the plane landed with full fuel tanks, it's already ready to head back to orbit, and the plane liked to start sliding around on the surface if I waited too long, so... I'm going to get right back in and head back to orbit. While I take off and start climbing, let me talk a bit about the details of the stock prop engines I use here. These start out attached to the plane inside the fairing at the rear. They are then held in place by bearings formed by the Stapotnik probes and smaller fairings inside the larger fairing. The large reaction wheels, which are powered by RTGs, now spin the whole module, including the control surfaces which function as propeller blades. I have two separate engines inside the large fairing at the rear, which spin in opposite directions, counteracting the torque from friction that's going to try to spin my craft out of control. Using the control surfaces as opposed to the wing surfaces for the propeller blades is absolutely critical here. In the hangar, they're set to an angle of attack of 55 degrees. They have the ability to control their pitch by 35 degrees in other direction. In normal use, I roll them in giving me 20 degrees of angle of attack. When I get to the later phase of the ascent when I'm not using the propeller engines anymore, they can roll the opposite direction all the way to a 90 degree angle of attack, which means they're facing directly forward and not providing any drag when we don't want them anymore. Since the takeoff mass of this plane is over 2 kilotons, I needed a lot of stock prop power. And as a result, there are hundreds of large reaction wheels in each of these engines. As a fun fact, this gives me more torque than any ship in the rear world, which includes the largest container ships powered by the world's largest piston engines. One technically unnecessary, but practically absolutely necessary feature of these engines is the ability to redock the engine with the rest of the craft. There's a grabber arm for each of these engines inside the fairing that after stopping the engine can dock it with the craft, which allows me to make a save and then reload the craft without the Kraken tearing it apart. The core reason why this was absolutely necessary is how long it's going to take me to ascend with the prop engines. Firstly, while these prop engines are very powerful, they're not very powerful compared to the size of this plane. So I needed a lot of wing surface area and a very slow climb speed for this to actually be able to fly. Secondly, due to some sort of crack in reason, I wasn't able to spin up the propeller engines to full torque at low altitude. I suspect this was a result of the high forces that were occurring when I did spin them up to full torque at low altitude. Lastly, due to the high part count and spinning propellers, my computer was absolutely struggling. 
game time was running slower than real time by a factor of more than 10 to 1. As a result, it took more than 48 hours of actual time for this to ascend from sea level to near the max altitude of this under prop power. Before you feel too sympathetic for me, I should note that it only required my input about every half hour or so, and due to the ability for me to lock the propellers, I was able to make pauses and sleep and go to work and do other things. In any case, this was still absolutely brutal, and I'm probably going to steer clear of anything involving stock props for quite a long time. Even cutting out the middle of this ascent, I had to speed up the time-lapse shots of this ascent so much that it required multiple rendering passes in Adobe Premiere. Now that I've gotten to 20 kilometers, it's time to fire up the rockets and start the fast part of this ascent. This is powered by 10 LVNs and 120 skiff engines. The skiff engine has the highest TWR of any conventional rocket engine available, and also has really strong vacuum ISP at 330. However, there's two th reasons why I haven't used these before. Firstly, they have really bad ISP at sea level, which doesn't matter so much here because we've used prop engines to get to a good altitude. They also have really high drag for their relative size. We've negated this by using the trick of clipping them all inside the fairing, making these engines really strong in this case, and they really make this mission possible. The wing surface area, which was absolutely crucial to the propeller phase, is more than excessive here, and due to the extra weight and extra drag, definitely hurts this phase more than it helps. Even with this extra drag, I still got better performance ascending at a fairly shallow angle. Even on EVE with the extra velocity lost to drag, velocity lost to gravity is always the worst threat to any attempt to go single stage to orbit. At 63 kilometers altitude and 3 kilometers per second surface speed, I ran out of liquid fuel oxidizer mix, which means the 10 LVNs will be lifting me the rest of the way to a fully circular orbit. The addition of the LVNs here was much more helpful than I had anticipated, and it was a, that was a big part in me being able to overcome the delta V hurdle that this posed. The upper limit of EVE's atmosphere is 90 kilometers, and generally when ascending, you want to try to do all of your ascent as low as possible. So having an apoapsis as high as I have here is generally a bad idea. However, the LVNs have very low TWR, so I didn't want to put in any more than I had to, which means that I need a little bit of extra time for these to be able to give me all the delta V that they're capable of. Putting my apoapsis a little bit higher just gives the LVNs more time to burn, which allows me to use more of the high ISP engine, save fuel, and get more delta V. With the extra height that I've given myself, I had just enough time to burn the LVNs and burn into a circular orbit before I started falling back to EVE. With that successful circularization, we have achieved the first propeller-driven EVE SSTO. We've managed a pretty good ascent, so Bill should have just enough fuel for this to plane to rendezvous with the refueler under its own authority. Rendezvous, refueling, and returning this to Kerbin is going to be fairly standard, so I'm going to zip through this pretty quickly to avoid a long anti-climax in this video. There was one brief moment of drama where I had an accidental rendezvous with the moon. Luckily, I had enough extra fuel that I was able to account for this and continue a safe and controlled descent. The next moment of drama came during the final touchdown at the KSC. Due to stability reasons that occur when this thing is almost empty of fuel, I couldn't fly it all the way down to the actual stall limit. As a result, I have to land at fairly substantial speed, and due to the weakness of the wheel brakes, I wouldn't have been able to stop in time on the runway. I therefore landed next to the runway to give myself more distance to brake in. At the end of the braking, I turned back up onto the runway, so I can say that I landed exactly on the runway. This landing still seemed rather anticlimactic, so I went on the KSP subreddit to come up with an idea for a more exciting landing. I then found that a lot of people think it's a cool idea to fly under the bridge. This is a plane, it's got wings, it's got control surfaces, so let's fly it under the bridge. All I'll have to do is line up with the small bridge, come in low, and then it's straight and easy. Now, I suspect that a lot of you are going to try to tell me that this looks like a crash, but you'll notice that the nose cone detaches in a very safe manner, safely returning Bill Kerman to the KSC. 
You'll also notice that there's been only minor damage to the buildings. A weekend with a power sander and some paint and it'll be as good as new. So thank you everyone for watching our totally safe non-crash landing and I'll see you in the next video.